Hi, thank you so much, Diana and Smriti, for joining me here today. I'm excited about our conversation. Um, so let's begin by hearing about your research. So Diana, let's begin with you. Can you tell us a little bit about your work? Thank you, Sharada, and the Children in Theory Project for inviting me. My name is Diana Carolina Garcia Gomez, and I am a Colombian Childhood Studies researcher. My work examines and centers children's and youth's self-constructions as political subjects by focusing on their participation in peace building through collective memory and peace education processes. I take a multidisciplinary approach to the Colombian post-accord context, drawing mainly from childhood studies, memory studies, and political philosophy. When I was in grad school in 2016, the Colombian government signed a peace treaty with FARC, the longest running guerrilla in the world at the time. I then knew that my work would seek to understand how young people in Colombia define themselves as political subjects in a country facing over 60 years of armed conflict and how the context impacted the boundaries of what is deemed appropriate political participation for the youth. In my work, I always intentionally combine decolonial and postcolonial theories and use ethnographic methods to examine children's political participation in places of memorialization in urban and rural settings. My research has allowed me to consider how notions of citizenship, temporality, identity construction, or victimhood, just to name a few, apply to this particular context. And by context, I mean, on the one hand, the Colombian context as the result of a specific colonial process, and on the other hand, the construction of children and youth as members of Colombian society under plausible rules in the post-conflict context. Thanks, Diana, for sharing your work with us. Um, let's move on to you, Smriti. Can you please tell us a little bit about your research? Thank you, Sharada. Uh, I'm excited to be in conversation with you through Children in Theory, both of you, Diana and Sharada. Um, I am Smriti Bala Karnan. I research adolescent life worlds in India through the lens of childhood studies. You might have encountered commonplace assumptions that educated people are somehow more hygienic, right? My research problematizes this link between education and healthy habits or cleanliness. Through ethnographic methods, I study tensions between environmental concerns and human health in young people's everyday lives and infrastructures. For instance, how they travel to school, wear clothes, use toilets, dispose waste, or learn signs, for instance. All this amongst what is around them, like the buildings, lakes, roads, and textbooks. Basically, whatever the young people negotiate with in their everyday, everyday lives, and in doing so, they point to inherent tensions and structural issues. It is very difficult to miss the continuing colonial logic and legacies in everyday infrastructures around children in these regions. I, in fact, moved into academic research after working as a practitioner in the education sector in India, mainly to be able to pay attention to children's experiences and listen to them talk about the complexities of navigating such legacies. I conducted my research on adolescent children's relational experiences of cleanliness and hygiene in urbanizing regions in Tamil Nadu, India. In a context like India, Hygiene and sanitation are embedded within long caste and colonial histories and in its most recent form, developmental regimes. Children have been and continue to be a key target group who are taught about hygiene and sanitation in schools. Now, this may seem like a very routine component of any school curriculum. Through my research, I learned that cleanliness is a shape-shifting concept through which institutions and communities produce and sustain forms of difference. Sharada, I would love to hear about your work. So thanks, Smriti. My research engages marginal children's experiences with labor, schooling, children's rights discourses, and post-school futures. My book, Inhabiting Childhood, Children Work and Schooling in Postcolonial India, which was published in 2014, is an ethnographic exploration of the lives of a group of street children and child laborers in the city of Kolkata in India. 
usually schooling is viewed as a solution to child labor. And what I was interested in was uncovering the tensions that marked efforts to enroll these laboring children in schools. My effort was less to judge the success of enrollment or to provide any kind of solution. Instead, what I was interested in was historicizing these present efforts. That is, in situating these present national and transnational efforts within a longer arc that included colonial modernity, as well as development policies in independent India. This longer arc helped contextualize these children's engagement and sharp analysis of the quality of schooling uh, that they were receiving, which was very poor quality schools, within a very much more politicized reading of their everyday lives. And this politicization is linked to the ways in which I've used post-colonial theory because my attempts are always to historicize the everyday lives of subaltern children. I draw on my ethnographic research on marginal children and youth experiences to decenter hegemonic framings of childhood, as well as to challenge the exclusionary and extractive logics that often underlie national development efforts, as well as transnational campaigns to improve their futures. So with those really interesting introductions of each of our works, um, Spruti, how does your work connect with postcolonial theory? Um, thank you, Diana. So postcolonial theory has been formative to my research pursuit. It allowed me to see signs for my project's case, hygiene, something that we have always been taught as objective and neutral, as both political and historically shaped. For instance, earlier colonial era campaigns portrayed the native non-white communities and their tropical environments as lacking in hygiene and presented adult communities as needing education and hygienic habits. To this day, we see the colonial schema within developmental projects where schools use children as conduits to teach their supposedly ignorant, rural or poor or other marginalized communities scientific principles of hygiene. When we speak of hygiene science, textbooks, campaigns, and even news tends to speak of hygiene as if it were a singular objective and scientific field of knowledge that flows from the metropole through urban and finally rural areas. You see a symbolic hierarchy of places and peoples from adults to children. Building off of what Friedrich Cooper and Ann Stoller speak of as racialized difference or othering that is continuously produced and legit uh, legitimizes the domination of the metropole. Logics of marginalized populations and life worlds are somehow inherently less hygienic, continues to work within national developmental policies of the post-colonial state and transnational philanthropy. My research situates children's self-experience today as clean bodies in school, as subjectivities, Ashish Nandi and Franz Fanon would characterize as formed through colonial dialectic. The epistemic and material devaluation of the hygienic other takes on various shapes and forms depending on who wields power. But postcolonial theory helps denaturalize hygienic othering both in the past as well as in the present. Sharada, would you like to respond to the question as well? Thanks, Tiana, for that question. As my anthropological and historical research is focused on India, I found the work of South Asian postcolonial theorists particularly generative. And these include, but are not limited to, Gayatri Spivak, Partho Chatterjee, Ashish Nondi, um, Dipesh Chakravarti, and Kalyan Sanyal. Spivak's idea of the subaltern is something that I constantly return to in my research. The children I engage are those who, as Spivak would characterize it, are removed from lines of social mobility and are, as she would say, the silent victims of pervasive rather than singular and spectacular human rights violations. 
I also think what Spivak does with the concept of the subaltern, that is her assigning subalternity, the function of acting as a reminder of how particular subjects become legitimate and audible while others continue to be excluded is of great significance for childhood studies. A related aspect of this is post-colonialism's attention to historicizing the present and I've borrowed from Partha Chatterjee's work to foreground the need to unpack children's rights by historicizing rights subjectivities. In addition, Kalyan Sanyal's analysis of post-colonial capitalism and the need economy has been useful in developing, for me, the concept that I call the politics of deferral. This concept attempts to disrupt the self-evidence of post-colonial development's incremental and linear efforts to improve marginal children's lives. And it does this by historicizing existing policies and practices to disclose how marginal children and their communities appear to be accommodated within a compensatory policy imaginary tied to the need economy and seldom as full citizens. So, Diana, can you tell us how you bring post-colonial theory into your work? Sure. Um, so, post-colonial theory has afforded me a framework to investigate why and how modern notions of political subjecthood fail to encapsulate the experiences of Colombian children and youth involved in peace building and collective memory. And I would like to focus on two critical ways. The first concern is the hegemonic temporality of modernity or what Pasdi and Jaramillo Aristizabal term the colonialities of chrononormativity. When centering children's participation in collective memory, the question demands a reconsideration of childhood. I am not only asking the very childhood studies question of children as beings or becomings tied to the present or the future, but also how the construction of possible futures in the present is framed by a demand to inhabit the past, to never forget and never repeat. So that demand to inhabit the past leads me to the second way post-colonial theory has influenced my work, which is by centering comprehensions of national identity. Post-colonial concepts such as homibaba's ambivalence and a hybridity become crucial when answering the question of the meaning of being Colombian. In my research, during some of the collective memory encounters, children and youth described being Colombian in two ways. On the one hand, they understood being Colombian as a failed liberal project that served the elites and was necessary for the continuation of the armed conflict. On the other hand, being Colombian was also understood as a lived citizenship, bounded by the historical suffering, and the democratic responsibility was actually with peace building and collective memory. So they demonstrated an ambivalent relationship with the modern legacy of what it means to be a citizen while defining themselves as a result of this hybrid identity construction. Thank you so much, Diana. What about post-colonial childhoods excites you? Sharada, would you like to respond to that? Thank you for this question, Smriti. Postcolonial scholars have made us acutely aware of how the experience of Europe often dominates the general epistemological framework of various disciplines. And this has been and continues to be true for childhood studies. The analytical scaffold that postcolonial theory offers childhood studies is one in which we become attentive to historicizing children's lives and the and analyzing the unevenness of citizenship and the role that past exclusions continue to play in the present. Postcolonial theory allows us to see that including diverse representations of non-Western children's lives is a less than adequate solution to existing epistemic hierarchies. Instead, these scholars remind us 
to continually ask questions around the terms through which this inclusion takes place. They draw our attention to the need for different categories that interrogate existing binaries and the hierarchies embedded within these. Scholars of postcolonial childhoods are engaged in both deconstructing and reconstructing from below. And I'm excited by this as the scholarship extends postcolonial theory in productive and new directions. In thinking about my research interests, um, what excites me about postcolonial childhood is the possibility of theoretically occupying spaces that have been guarded and closed for most people. Academic, academic inquiry has been guarded, not only through who gets to be a part of it, but also in terms of disciplinary boundaries. So as a researcher interested in children's political participation in a context of protracted conflict, and in practices of activism, such as collective memory, I am bridging epistemic traditions, such as the Latin American interest in the colonial theory and memory studies with post-colonial childhoods, such as the questioning of hegemonic epistemologies and ontologies. And in that way, interpolate Western ideas of childhood. So I see post-colonial childhood as a double invitation uh, for marginalized communities to be involved in knowledge creation and as an attempt to tear down imposed disciplinary boundaries. Smruti, what excites you about postcolonial childhoods? Thank you so much, Diana. So, what excites me about postcolonial childhoods framework is how it combines theoretical depth and relevance to practice. I came to learn about this framework you have built, Sharada, through very applied research, finding that it gives a language to speak about some of the patterns or politics in, say, school infrastructures. Developmental projects, especially those around children, are often held as sort of sacrosanct. There is an affective emotional tug against questioning something like an infrastructure, say, toilet or sanitary pads for girls in marginalized communities. Your work brought us to consider how Ashish Nandi's discussion about the colonial infantilizing of native adults and communities shapes institutions and infrastructures for actual children in the post-colonies. The most important pathway through post-colonial post -colonial studies for me methodologically was to be able to listen to young people's critiques and negotiations of the structures they encounter much more openly without feeling compelled to selectively listen only when the children agree with dominant developmental agendas and trends around childhood. I also get to read and learn from other scholars who do similar work. So that's really exciting. Wow. So thank you for this engagement, Diana and Smriti. Although our projects are in different geographies across the world and within India, there are so many similarities in the ways in which we use post-colonial theory to destabilize existing assumptions, question hierarchies in knowledge production, look for exclusions within liberal projects of inclusion, and all of these are potential lines of inquiry that postcolonial theory offers childhood researchers and practitioners. So thanks again, Diana and Smriti, for this really thought-provoking conversation. <laughs>